I'm sure you have heard of the NoFap community and the idea of sperm retention. The alleged benefits of abstaining from pointless sexual pleasure range from increased productivity, intensified focus, confidence and whatnot. Well, actually, we have got a somewhat obscure English anthropologist who had taken the idea of sexual abstinence and sexual repression to a whole civilizational level, where he analyzes societies with regard to how they repress their sexual energy, thereby channeling it to a productive social endeavors. In his most popular work, Sex and Culture, he analyzes 80 pre-societal tribes and high civilizations, where he wants to discover whether there is any causal connection between sexual abstinence and the social energy that a particular society exhibits at a given moment. Surely the core presupposition of Unwin's research is Freudian here. The, this is the idea of the sublimation, whereby the sexual repression that a culture officiates on its members uh, is channeled into a productive social activity. So if this presupposition is correct, then Unwin should find a consistent pattern of uh, sexual restriction predicting social complexity. Now if we look at the charts that Unwin provides in his book, uh, we're going to see a consistent pattern of the 80 civilizations that he analyzes, namely that all the societies that uh, lack complex social structures, temples, and the post-funeral service dedicated to uh, diseased, uh, they all allow for um, sexual laxity, meaning that uh, these societies do not insist on the chastity of females uh, before marriage. The types of societies that do not build temples or provide any complex post-funeral service to the diseased are called zoistic, that is, the cultures that do not insist on prenuptial chastity. Zoe comes from the Greek word and means life. Here, a uh, zoistic uh, condition describes a dead level of conception, where satisfying one's physiological needs uh, is a primary motivation, whereby they live on the first stage of Maslow's pyramid. Generation after generation, the same tradition is pursued, and time doesn't alter them. In other words, their cultural condition doesn't change irrespective of how much time passes. In such a society, human beings are born, they satisfy their desires, and they die. And when their corpses have been disposed of, they're simply forgotten. No complex post-funeral service is provided. According to Unwin, if rational cultures, that is, for example, the Western culture, allow for sexual freedom for more than three generations, such a rational culture can revert back to the zoistic culture. Now, in such a case, the social energy that was accumulated by a rational culture through a consistent practice of absolute monogamy will be lost, and therefore they will be swallowed up by another society who keeps uh, sexual regulations. However, we will touch on that later. Uh, let's just now look at other levels of social conditions that Unwin provides. Next, we have uh, monistic societies which follow um, zoistic societies. Now, in monistic societies, as opposed to the zoistic ones, occasional sexual continence is demanded. So here we can already see that the sexual restriction already predicts an increased social complexity, since monistic societies, unlike the zoistic ones, already build um, some type of huts or simple temples over the graves of the disease. So they have this practice of the post-funeral service, which is absent in zoistic societies, whereby they have a very simple understanding of the world and they do, haven't developed some form of religious mythology whereby they would um, explain the transfer of the soul from the earthly world uh, to, let's say, to a supernatural world, okay? Next, following the monistic societies, we have deistic societies. And deistic societies are such societies that insist on prenuptial chastity of females. Not only that, but in deistic societies, uh, males too have to confine their sexual qualities to one or multiple females if they practice polygamy. In deistic societies, uh, unlike in monistic and zoistic ones, uh, now we have got temples and priests who are specialized into being mediums between humans and supernatural deities. 
Now, in deistic societies where sexual uh, restrictions are pretty serious, uh, such societies already exhibit what Unwin calls an expansive energy, which is a subcategory of the social energies that uh, cultures exhibit as a result of sexual restrictions. There is also another type of energy, which is productive energy. Uh, however, we will touch on that later. The expansive energy, then, is a type of energy whereby cultures expand horizontally. The energy that comes from the sexual restriction now can be used to conquer other nations. So this is the, you know, we are already getting to this ultimate uh, sperm retention nofap, uh, you know, idea whereby the transmutation here uh, gets really serious. And now we get to the rational societies, where the sperm retention, you know, uh, this nofap, absolute abstinence thing, uh, you know, peak, peak, literally peaks, okay? These are absolute beast societies where they always start with absolute monogamy. And absolute monogamy, unlike three other types of uh, sexual regulations that... Um, on win list, we will touch on them. Um, absolute monogamy is is the highest form of sexual restriction, where not only females but males also have to restrict their sexual opportunity to one particular uh, female. Okay. Rational societies then have a material understanding of the universe, which is distinct from the mythic understanding of the universe. And they use this material understanding of the universe to bend it uh, to their will so that they can exploit nature. They develop specific technologies and whatnot. So, you know, this is some sperm hitting the forehead thing. Now, according to Anwin, absolute monogamy, which is the best practice to produce the most social energy, has its downside. Namely, that it puts an unbearable stress on a society, which leads to the breakdown of uh, this sexual strategy. And then, such society, when it un undergoes a breakdown of the sexual regulation, such society collapses and it loses its immune system. However, what Anwin claims here is that the idea of emancipating women and giving them the rights to divorce their husbands is not peculiar or specific to Western civilization, but rather it happened in all uh, cultures that uh, had undergone this cycle. And this cycle then uh, is uh, basically broken down in three steps. In the first step, we have got a type of marriage whereby husbands literally buy wives from uh, their fathers, uh, whereby they provide a bride price. In the second phase, uh, the gender balance somewhat increases, whereby the bride price is substituted by the dowry, which is a form of material assets that the father of the daughter provides her with. So now it becomes somewhat mutual, where the daughter side also contributes something to the marriage. And the third phase is when the economical side of marriage is downgraded and whereby marriage just becomes a matter of mutual agreement. Here, not only is marriage subject to a personal desires of a, you know, a male and a female, but rather females can now divorce their husbands and take their dowry with them. So, for, for example, it happened in a Babylonian society where in Code of Hammurabi, we already see laws where uh, females are already allowed to leave their husbands and take their dowry with them. And according to Anwin, it happened to Greece, to Rome, to Anglo-Saxon society, and as I mentioned, to the Babylonian society. Hence, from modern perspective, Unwin's idea is somewhat sexist, as the core element of his research is that basically the sexual regulation of females is more important than of males, as females basically constitute the bedrock of how productive the society is going to be, since they are the ones who are going to raise future architects, politicians, intellectuals, and so on and so forth. And one example, among many, that Unwin provides to demonstrate the importance of sexual regulation with regards to females is the culture of Spanish Moors. The Islamic society of Spanish Moors uh, boasted economic flourishing, um, high arts, um, philosophy, science, and whatnot. Now, Spanish Moors, since they were Muslims, they practiced absolute polygamy, which is one level below absolute monogamy in its ability to produce social energy. Hence, uh, there is a need of explanation of why this society achieved such a big cultural success. And the explanation that Anwin provides is that they married Jewish-slash-Christian females 
that were brought up in a culture of absolute monogamy. So they infused Spanish Moors with a productive social energy. And after three or more generations, when the practice of absolute polygamy swallowed the social energy that was brought forth by um, Jewish slash Christian females, uh, Spanish Moors lost their social vigor and basically uh, their culture uh, waned. And by marrying women who came from the practice of absolute monogamy, Spanish Moors basically leveled up from an expansive energy to the productive energy. Now let's review the four sexual strategies that Unwin lists. So we have got modified monogamy, whereby it is a practice of having one spouse at one time, the association being terminable by either party. So divorce is allowed in the case of modified monogamy. Here the word modified basically describes this idea that it was modified from absolute monogamy, where divorce is not an option, to a modified monogamy where you can now divorce your husband and take your dowry with you. Next we have got modified polygamy. Uh, this is the practice of having more than one wife at one time. Uh, but wives are free to leave their husbands and take dowry with them. Next, we have got absolute polygamy, the practice of having more than one wife at one time, but these wives are compelled to confine themselves to their husbands for the whole of their lives. Now, this is the case of Islamic societies where they exhibit deistic, expansive energies whereby they conquer other nations. However, unlike the Western ones, they lack the productive energy that we're going to talk about right now. And lastly, we have got absolute monogamy, which is, you know, the ultimate sperm retention. So basically, absolute monogamy is a practice of having one spouse at one time, but legally, the wife is under the dominion of her husband with no option of divorce. Here, wife literally belongs to her husband. This is the highest level of sexual regulation, whereby not only females, but males are also sexually restricted, and it produces a productive social energy. And the productive social energy, unlike the expansive one, is not only horizontal, but is also vertical. So it presupposes the horizontal expansive energy, whereby you conquer other nations, but it also has the verticality to it. And here verticality means that the productive so social energy helps you to develop a material understanding of the universe, whereby you you conquer the mental slash spiritual plane as opposed to the simple physical expansive space. Such societies are directed at high parental investment. So cross-culturally, monogamy correlates with social complexity that includes division of labor, organized religion, intensive plow agriculture, and the existence of heritable private property. So further genetic studies show that um, the existence of polygamy is more characteristic of hunter-gatherer society, where a sedentary agricultural lifestyle hasn't come forth yet, which then predicts uh, you know, political complexity, which then in and of itself demands uh, high social energy which then demands monogamy and, you know, the reservation of your sexual pleasures so that it can be sublimated into a productive activity. So the dilemma Anwin puts forward sounds as follows. Any human society is free to choose either to display great energy or to enjoy sexual freedom. The evidence is that it cannot do both for more than one generation. Now, getting to the Western society, whereby the idea of sexual laxity and sexual freedom is so uh, popular, you know, since in pop culture right now there is, a, you know, there are discussions about, let's say, Conor McGregor, who is always contrasted with Khabib Nurmagomedov, where Conor McGregor allows himself all the sexual pleasures and hedonistic lifestyle. You know, on the other hand, we have Muslim fighters who restrict their sexual opportunity and hence they, you know, uh, exhibit more discipline, more social energy, more vigor and whatnot. Now, this is consistent with Unwin's uh, primary law, namely that any society in which complete prenuptial sexual freedom has been permitted for at least three generations will be in the zoistic cultural condition. It will also be at a dead level of conception if it has not been in a higher cultural condition. So, hence, in the case of the Western society, with the advent of sexual revolution and sexual freedom, it has been consistently losing its social vigor and social energy, hence allowing for the risk of it being swallowed or gobbled up by its external enemies that were always motivated to basically uh, destroy and gobble 
Western civilization up. And right now there is all, all those talks about how you know, Western society can be conquered by other nations and so on and so forth. And here it is important for us to understand the differences between the Western soul and the Western practice of absolute monogamy with the practice of absolute polygamy, which is characteristic of Islamic societies, since right now there is all these you know, comparisons with how you know, Muslim people um, are you know, allegedly more conservative and they restrict their sexual opportunity and hence they are more disciplined and so on and so forth. Now, as we already mentioned, absolute monogamy is able to produce a product active energy which is vertical and can conquer the mental plane whereby you have a complex understanding of material universe Whereas, on the other hand, the uh, expansive energy is purely horizontal, where it conquers other nations and expands uh, physically on a horizontal space. And this is very interesting because it nicely maps onto Oswald Spengler's understanding of what differentiates Western Faustian culture from uh, Russian culture and what are the uh, differences in their prime symbols. Oswald Spengler ascribes the striving towards infinite space, uh, which is basically expressed in, you know, West long-range weapons with their universal literacy, you know, Gothic uh, cathedrals that are soaring up in the sky, you know, rockets and so on and so forth, which is basically then um, uh, Oswald Spengler contrasts with Russia. And he ascribes the prime symbol of plane without limits to Russia, whereby horizontal expansion is the symbol that describes the soul of Russians, according to Spengler, whereby expansive energy is all it has, whereby Russians are such people, according to Spengler, who roam around horizontally and they conquer the horizontal plane. Okay? And, you know, he also contrasts the onion capolas of um, Russia, which are horizontal, and Gothic cathedrals, which are vertical in its valency. You know, there was even uh, one uh, Russian architect who basically had the idea of creating um, horizontal uh, skyscrapers. Also, you know, um, you know, Alexander Dugin, who is all about, you know, defending Russian soul and stuff, he basically borrowed this idea of the uh, plane without limits from Spengler, and his prime symbol is, is basically... Um, what, what, what basically defines this idea of a horizontal expansion, which, uh, you know, contrasts this verticality of, of the West. Now, since uh, right now West has lost its sexual regulations, um, you know, there is this idea that it needs a solution. And, for example, the solution right now is that, you know, West needs to adopt some form of practices that other cultures can offer, let's say, Russia with its supposed traditionalism, which, uh, you know, which needs a, another examination, or, let's say, um, uh, Islam, for example, which can offer a solution. Now, there are a couple of problems with this idea. First, um, West saved by Islam is not a West anymore or won't be a West. So there is no saving the West in the equation of Islam, you know, overtaking the West. It is not going to be the West anymore because the, its upward vertical scientific or rational uh, valency is completely uh, different and alien to the Islamic one, okay? So no matter how much mental gymnastics the despisers of the West engage in to somehow explain away the absolute significance of Western cultural achievements with regard to science, philosophy, arts, and so on and so forth, you know, it is still clear to me that um, basically Western technology, arts, and sciences are unmatched in their perspicacity and sheer indefinite, uh, you get the point. And I'm saying that as a non-Westerner. So the problem of the West is a Western problem as it undergoes its own cultural cycle. Hence, any form of resolution or any form of evolution is going to be peculiar to the West. So, you know, no aliens, no Andrew Tates or no Russias or Mongolias are going to save the West. The future cultural stages of the Western civilization, then, is a matter of a different video. So I'll make a separate one about the future of Western civilization and what it can evolve into. Now I want to thank my Patreons who are immense help to the channel. So if you want to become one, I have provided the link in the description.